I think Patron spoke earlier this week, the fact that 2.5 million students every year learn SOLIDWORKS as a part of their design and engineering curriculum. There's no one at SOLIDWORKS more passionate about education than our next presenter. Please join me in welcoming the stage, Marie Planchard. Marie. Thank you very much. Two and a half million. This week, we have seen you design without limits. On Monday, we saw Red Bull Stratus design team lead us on a successful mission to the edge of space. On Tuesday, we saw Vijay Kumar's robots, those autonomous swarming robots, jump through hoops, harmonize in music, and coordinate communication halfway around the world to Tohoku University in Japan on a successful search mission. And then there was the engineers from Festo, who was not uplifted in our hearts and open our minds to that very smart bird. Students also design without limits. They have come from afar, all the way from Colombia this week, from the Universidad Militar Nueve Granada, and down the street at the University of Central Florida. They too share our passion. And we have heard stories from dedicated educators that every day inspire students in engineering design. They share the job-ready skills necessary with SolidWorks certification to be qualified for our talented commercial customers. And we have heard your stories from you, our customers, our resellers, and our partners. You have mentored students at your places of work and after school activities. Our next guest is the SolidWorks mentor. He is an entrepreneur, an innovator, an inventor, and a chemical engineer. He uses his dream as leader of the robot mavericks and a visionary to allow space to be accessed by all. Let's watch in this video. Each and every one of you were selected because you're really bright, you got good, strong scientific skills from robotics to engineering to science. So we're actually gonna take all the knowledge you guys have as a collective group um, and we're gonna apply it to build a rocket. What we're gonna do with these kids here is we're gonna make rocket scientists out of them. I had absolutely no idea what was in store. Then I saw the syllabus and I actually saw like, wow, they're actually gonna be learning rocket science. We said that's gonna be our like textbook, right? They're gonna be drinking out of a fire hose. Be careful what you wish for. You may get it. That's you it. Get one for everybody else. <laughs> they're going to be involved with everything from the design of the nose cone on looking at gas dynamics, performance envelope, propulsion systems. Basically, we've built a rocket and uh, it's ready to fly. So that's kind of the good news. Is there bad news? Yeah. There's bad news. We got a weather hold, um, and I don't know how long you hold. Now that they've had some time, kind of the, the pace of getting everything done and ready to fly and pushing for the April flight window that just didn't work because of the weather, it's going to be very interesting to see their perspective on things. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Black Rock Desert. We're uh, here to do, launch a very important project, and I'm here to conduct the safety briefing. My name is Wedge Oldham. Range safety is not flexible, nor am I. Are we clear on that? Things will always go wrong. You don't really see it coming until it hits you, and when it's actually down to the line. We want all the people that showed up with all the limbs and fingers that they came with to go home with those same amount of limbs and fingers. Let's get the copper thermite. I need your help. We have such a short window to launch this thing, and if the weather doesn't cooperate, we can't launch it. This one powers the telemetry system. 1200 will put us at uh, T minus 45 minutes, and we're going to go from there, and we're going to be real. It's really, really close coming down now. But 
It's gonna be fun. I've never done anything with one try. Something always goes wrong. I swear to God, we need to get on this. I get worried about everything. Launch control, go in or go. Still at T minus one minute, the time is one twenty-nine. We are at T minus one minute, waiting for Tom Ross and the rest of the people to clear the vehicle area. This is, this is, wow, this is so intense. And there certainly are a lot of risks and things that could malfunction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are go for launch. All stations report ready in all respect. We are going in. We have permission to launch the vehicle. Go for launch. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Please join me in warm SolidWorks welcome and welcoming on stage Tom Atchison from the Rocket Mavericks. Wow. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Welcome thank to you. SolidWorks World. Well, well, I want to thank you for the privilege of being here. I, I can't tell you um, how overwhelmed I am with the opportunity to speak with probably the largest group of the greatest designers and engineers and entrepreneurs like myself. Um, I'm, I'm just floored to be here. Well, we're glad you're here. You have a great story to share with us today. You're working with students in a really creative way. Could you tell us a little bit of something about the Rocket Mavericks? Um, well, the Mavericks uh, got together probably in uh, about 2005, 2006. Uh, it was some of the leading uh, civilian space explorers. We were building vehicles. We all had that passion as our generation uh, very much sat by the TVs and watched the launch of Apollo. Um, that's why I became an engineer. That's why a lot of our friends became engineers. Uh, but still deep-seated in us was that desire to build something ourselves uh, that breaks the Kármán line, which defines space. Um, and in pursuit of that, what I found was is that same value was shared by the community around me, but also the kids in my neighborhood. Now, you know, so we formed this nonprofit foundation because what I found is through the act of working on these vehicles with us, uh, there, was an uh, there was an opportunity to inspire these kids uh, to actually participate and apply what they learn in science and technology and engineering and math. Uh, so we formed the foundation in 2007, and uh, the primary focus there was to leverage STEM education that they were getting in the classroom, but to give them a way to demonstrate their mastery of those principles by actually either succeeding or failing, which has a lot of educational value as well, and actually building and launching a vehicle uh, into space. Um, and as you know, space is kind of not this monolithic place. It's kind of got this area near space, and that's a great place for middle school kids to play with balloons. They can still get up above the blue line. It's beautiful out there. They feel like they're in space. The rockets are really well slated for high school students. They have the math and the science to actually conduct missions there. Um, and then at the university level, both orbital applications and even now small spacecraft people are building um, and starting to look at actually getting out into the solar system and Lagrange points. Uh, but the big point of this program is there's lots and lots of rocket programs in this country, and they're really great. Families participate in them. But when you take a rocket and actually have design limitations for specific mission applications, you're no longer flying rockets. You're flying missions. That's great, Tom. 
how did you go from chemical engineer and <laughs> get your interest in space exploration? Yeah, so it's a funny transition. You know, um, uh, as I mentioned, we were all kind of uh, uh, born out of this excitement in the Apollo program. Um, I'm a chemical engineer who kind of got hijacked in Silicon Valley before computer engineering was really a discipline. Um, and uh, I, I, I took a job with Hewlett Packard in their research labs. And of course, as a scientist and an engineer, we had to write our own code. So I kind of got hijacked off uh, into, the, uh, into the software industry for a while. But after 25 years of that um, and a number of companies that I did, I started to realize that I was a chemical engineer at heart, and I really hadn't done anything with my career there. And uh, uh, very similar to von Braun and Korolev in Russia and Goddard here in the United States, who all started building amateur rockets, I started building rockets. And the rockets got bigger, uh, and my neighbors got more nervous. Uh, and the FBI showed up a couple times, and I got a call from Homeland Security, and then my homeowners association was upset because all their lawyers with those big, thick books of all the stuff you're not allowed to do, well, building intercontinental ballistic missiles wasn't in there. So anyway, so it got a little out of control, uh, and I thought, well, you know, maybe we need to find a safe place. And so uh, I went and called up NASA and said, hey, you know, my neighbors are a little bit nervous with these big missiles around. Uh, maybe we should put them someplace that the public would be more comfortable. Um, but I think, you know, in my heart, there was still this desire to give back. And the kids were kind of, you know, around, and the neighbors were a little nervous about having their kids around me at first. But, but there's a heart in me about mentoring. There's a, an image up here. This is actually a picture from my high school. Uh, this fine gentleman over here, that's Steve Jobs. Um, and there's a group of us in Silicon Valley that were really touched at Homestead High School uh, by a mentor. Uh, he was our shop teacher, um, and he inspired a lot of us to try to create the world that we wanted to live in. Um, and we all carried that in different ways. And so, so I decided to take this and not only enable the ability to get the common man to be able to access space because of the technology we would have, uh, but what I tried to do was leverage computational processing in, in a fashion where we can actually start reaching both uh, orbital applications as well as suborbital launch vehicles. Well, we just saw a launch, and we have a, a pretty technical audience here. I, I love talking with engineers all week, even though I'm a mechanical engineer and that, you know, the chemicals right. and mechanicals fight sometimes. But can you share with us a little bit about what the launch process is all about? Well, so, um, so, so flying a mission, basically flying space missions, uh, requires a couple things. First, you got to get out of the gravity well. Um, and uh, you may want to not get completely out if you, you know, it depends whether you're doing orbital or suborbital type applications. Uh, but generally speaking, you're given a mission. It's either an orbital mission or a suborbital mission. Um, and that mission has certain requirements. Like, for instance, uh, the video that you saw here with the students, we're very interested in bioprospecting because we don't know how far off the surface of the Earth life really exists. Um, so, so you get these mission requirements of a very specific thing that you have to do. Um, and then the design process then begins. Now, many of these high school kids could never build a launch vehicle from scratch. And we help with that. And, and so we have a reference design. We pre-flight qualify. But then the students have to modify that design uh, and in the process learn about how to build a launch vehicle or a spacecraft. And so uh, we use the computational processing tools to take the requirements for the mission, translate those into design changes on the reference design, and then use simulation to visualize the impact of those design changes uh, actually on the flight performance of the vehicle. Um, and that, so from there, we can then transition, once we have a design selected, we go ahead and take that, um, and we now have to, uh, to convert it into machine tooling, build the vehicle, and that's the first half, as you saw there with the students, right. and we all sit around. And then there's the second half, and the second half is actually launching and flying it. And, and this is also a great opportunity. Uh, but we don't turn it over to NASA. But as you see, we got to deal with the same stuff NASA does. And we had a little problem with moisture that, uh, that spring, and so things got delayed a bit. But uh, we get out there. We got to set up the launch site. They got to operate all those things and launch the vehicle, run the mission, grab the data, bring back the telemetry, and then recover the vehicle, because these vehicles are not expendable. These are actually reusable launch vehicles. A, a lot of details. So why in all of this did you select SolidWorks? 
Well, so SOLIDWORKS is pretty interesting. So what I was looking for was a single platform that we weren't going to have to spend a lot of times with the students focusing on all the details of all these different packages, simulation, computational fluid dynamics, FEA, as well as modeling, and then all the machine tooling, CAM, and all that. And uh, so I was searching for something, and uh, I, I, uh, I, got, I got exposed to uh, Frank Payton and Chris Miller out on the West Coast. Uh, and they They're said, are, hey. are resellers. Yeah, and, and they said, hey, you know, you really ought to check out this SOLIDWORKS package. And I, I, so we started looking in that and then the development of the program and the designs. And it turned out that SOLIDWORKS, unlike any other platform out there, really has, through a single interface, a portal into all of these, which is perfect for the education environment. Because once the students master that environment, it, it, whether you want to do your tooling with the CAM packages, the machine pieces, some of the new additive manufacturing capabilities with 3D printers that are coming, um, as well as the simulation capabilities, through one package there, they had access to all the tools they were going to need to prepare for the mission. And, and this took your, your middle school kids all the way through high school and into the, the college well, the, program. So the first, the first session you have here is, is the high school students, and then they're preloaded for the university environment. Um, obviously, the launch vehicles are, are not being built by the, by the middle school kids. Middle school kids are building the payloads that actually fly on balloons, but they still fly to about 130,000 feet, which is... <laughs> You know, no drop in the bucket. It's a lot more than the SS rockets that I used to do in the backyard and get yeah, in trouble with my absolutely. mother. Um, SolidWorks is, is really excited to work with you. And I am excited to announce today that on behalf of SolidWorks, this is a surprise, we didn't rehearse this, that we would like to sponsor your next mission. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, uh, Surprise. I, uh, I guess the I, only question I've got for you is uh, who here is going to push the launch button? I don't know. I think we should open it up to our customers to see. What else can they do to get involved? Uh, well, uh, we need your support. If we're going to rebuild uh, the, the space uh, uh, facility and kind of take the torch that NASA's passing off to everybody, we need all of you to support and join us. The skills everybody here has, there's no question any one of you couldn't build and launch one of these. Um, and uh, we want to encourage you to do it. I want you to reach out to the foundation. We need your support. We need your company support. But I think to all of the folks that are here and the schools and communities that they represent, we can rebuild an even larger space program and get humans out into the um, universe from the ground up rather than a national program from the top down. So I invite you all to join us, come to our website, tell us your ideas, um, and, and get started and have some fun. Tom, thank you for joining us at SolidWorks World and mentoring so many students. And thank you for all of you who help out students around the world using SolidWorks. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you very much.